So uh, without further ado, I will just uh, introduce uh, Peter Danchin. Peter Danchin is an assistant professor of law at the University of Maryland School of Law. And I will end the presentation here because I think that uh, we uh, uh, ben will, benefit for, will benefit from your, your views, so we'll have plenty of time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh. This, this is on. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much um, to Saba and Hedy and Olivier for inviting me uh, to speak at this, at this wonderful conference. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to, to have the opportunity to, to listen and learn from so many scholars. Uh, I should say also that I live in Baltimore, so uh, the home of the wire. Uh, so being in, uh, in Berkeley is a little like going to heaven, I think. Um, and I'm greatly enjoying being at the university. Let me say uh, at the outset that uh, my field is international law and not Islam, uh, and my work focuses on the place of human rights essentially in international legal theory. Uh, and what I've been working on, I think most consistently and in a concentrated way, uh, is the nature and scope of the right to freedom of religion as an aspect of international law. Uh, which, as I think this conference shows, uh, is an increasingly divisive and contested uh, question. For me, what is most interesting about recent controversies surrounding Islam, and in particular the place of Islamic norms uh, in both European nation states as well as in the international legal sphere, and here the sorts of uh, controversies I think are familiar to everyone, We've heard discussion, of course, about the veil, about Sharia, uh, and what I'm going to talk mostly about is about the, the so-called Danish cartoons controversy. Uh, what is most interesting to me is how these uh, encounters with Islam are unsettling and um, are causing us to think more deeply about our existing normative categories, uh, and in particular about the historical and theoretical premises of modern liberal political orders. Um, what I've found in discussing these issues is that this is most unsettling for liberals. Uh, liberals who are particularly attached to the sacredness of, uh, of liberal rights and freedoms. Um, and as Saba Mahmoud has, has put it in her work, I think this requires considerable labor, uh, critical labor as well as uh, hard intellectual labor to try to understand the unfolding, uh, of, the unfolding of thinking on these issues really over the last three centuries. And I've, I've discovered that one really has to do that kind of work to make any headway in this field. If the Salman Rushdie case was a pointer to the emergence of some of these questions associated with liberal governance in multi-religious and multicultural societies, then of course the events of September 11, 2001 catapulted these problems to the, to the forefront of political and legal discussion in a way that few of us could have imagined at the end of the 20th century. And this can really be seen in both secular and religious fields of discourse. Let me just quickly point to a couple of examples. Think for a moment about Jürgen Habermas, that doyen of post-Kantian philosophical history for whom Kant's metaphysics of noumenal community devolves majestically into a politics of liberal democratic deliberation in the public sphere. Well, in 2006, Habermas stunned his, criti his critics and his admirers alike with the following characterization of egalitarian universalism, and I paraphrase only slightly. Christianity and nothing else has functioned for the normative self-understanding of modernity and is the ultimate foundation of liberty, conscience, human rights, and democracy the benchmarks of Western civilization. To this day, we have no other options. We continue to nourish ourselves from this source. Everything else is just postmodern chatter. Uh, or think in a different context of Pope Benedict's now infamous Regensburg lecture uh, in the same year. And of course, Habermas and, and, and uh, Pope Benedict have been engaged in a discussion on these issues uh, uh, since then. 
Most of the response and commentary on the Regensburg lecture focused on the opening and unfortunate salvo against Islam. But if you actually read the lecture in its totality, what is actually most interesting about it, uh, as Talal Assad has noted re uh, recently, is the way that Benedict links his discursive attack against Islam to a much more sustained critique of European reason itself, his main critique, I would suggest. According to Benedict, Islamic theology separates the concept of God and from reason, making him utterly unpredictable, therefore irrational, whereas Christianity maintains their inseparability in its harmonization of Hellenic rationality with the status of the divine. The main target then of the lecture, and it really is a, a terrific text to read uh, for a number of reasons, uh, is that this is the successive waves of dehellenization in European thought, from the Reformation via Kant and liberal theology to scientific positivism. By all of these means, the inner bond between faith and reason is ruptured, according to Benedict. Therefore, uh, his words are aimed at reaffirming the identification of reason with divinity and at unsettling our modern understanding of what is today known somewhat monistically as the Enlightenment. Benedict more recently has said that the Enlightenment is of Christian origin, and it is no accident that it was born precisely and exclusively in the realm of, Christian, of the Christian faith. All of this is pretty heavy stuff. Uh, or think finally about much of the work uh, in legal and political theory over the last few years which is directed towards examining particular conceptions of secularism and its relationship to the structure of public law. And I use the term public law here to refer to both public national law as well as public international law. And I, that, I'm going to say something about that in a moment. The main claim in much of this critical literature is that the doctrinal origins of post-Westphalian international law, and here, of course, the magic date is 1648, Every international law class begins somehow in 1648. Uh, that's when the light shone forth from a past of religious strife and we were liberated into the realm of secular reason and the public sphere of international law. Uh, much of this critical scholarship questions that assumption um, and important respects focuses on the Enlightenment critique of Christianity itself and the way that uh, uh, political and intellectual thought has sought to reconfigure the, re the relations between religious and civil governance in the wake of their separation uh, in the mid-17th century. So, for example, T. N. Martin has argued uh, that uh, this conception of secularism, uh, the, the, the basic flaw of the ideology of secularism is its claim to a holistic and non-dualistic character, and the separation of the domains of the sacred and the secular must be acknowledged everywhere in the same manner. The problem, Martin notes, with the acceptance of this position uh, is that many non-Western religions or non-Christian -Christi religious traditions either do not make this distinction, for example, Islam, or do it hierarchically, for example, Hinduism, subsuming the secular under the sacred. What these scholars suggest then is that when these largely forgotten and today almost invisible doctrinal relationships and categories are brought back to the foreground, we start to see the undesirable and ultimately uncheckable consequences of Enlightenment's reason, sorry, of Enlightenment reason's prejudice against prejudice and the failure of its claim to objectivity. Uh, and here I might just point to the work of, uh, uh, of Hans-Georg Gadamer, on the situationality um, and historicality of reason in living and finite traditions, which I think captures this idea of the failure of enlightenment claims to, rash, to ob objectivity. In all of these accounts then, the notion of religious freedom as international right has a particular history, a time and a place of origin. This history tells the story of the modernist turn to subjectivity and the ensuing difficulties of the Cartesian opposition of subject and object, which basically shape all international legal discourse. Richard Bernstein has described this opposition, these oppositions in the following terms. 
The conception of knowledge as being a correct repre representation of what is objective. The conviction that human reason can completely free itself of bias, prejudice, and tradition. The ideal of a universal method by which we can first secure the foundations of knowledge and then build the edifice of a universal science, a juridical science. The belief that by the power of self-reflection itself, we can transcend our historical context and horizon and know, know things as they really are in themselves. And here you can obviously hear echoes of uh, Kantian uh, philosophy. Well, each of these three lines of thought raise, I think, unsettling questions about liberal modernity and about secularity itself. And we see these particularly in the areas of religious toleration and cultural pluralism. There is actually very interesting work emerging now looking back to the early modern enlightenment uh, and showing that in fact, of course, we need to pluralize the enlightenment and understand more carefully how in the early modern enlightenment many of these issues were far more contested than we believe them to be today. And I'll say more of that later. Well, unlike what the program says, I've actually titled my lecture, Who's Public, Which Law? Mapping Freedom of Religion in Secular Public Spheres, with apologies, of course, to Alice Day McIntyre. This is because in talking about the public sphere in our modern condition, at least from a legal perspective, we have to talk about at least two public spheres, perhaps more, uh, and at least two normative legal systems. And here I refer to both the domestic uh, or national legal system on the one hand, and international law, public international law, uh, and indeed in many cases regional systems of public international law on the other, such as most famously in Europe. And here we confront, I think, a quite central and basic dilemma. How do we understand the conceptual relationship between the rights of states on the one hand and the rights of individuals on the other? Now, historically, classic Westphalia, Westphalianism has offered a somewhat, at least a relatively clear uh, picture of this relationship. The fundamental rights and duties of states, regardless of their private belief systems or forms of political organization or culture, are to be determined by that body of customary and conventional, conventional norms known as public international law. The fundamental rights and duties of individuals, regardless of their private comprehensive religious, philosophical, or other moral doctrines, are to be determined by that body of conventional norms known as public law or constitutional law. The former defines the sovereignty of states as the subjects of a putative international community. The latter defines the liberty of individuals as subjects of a national community in the form of a state. In each case, there's a distinction between public and private, and a particular conception of fundamental rights is advanced. These then, in turn, create the various internal external dichotomies which drive people like me crazy. Now, what I want to point out is that it's critical to realize at the outset that the underlying rationale of the move to public law, whether d domestic or international, is to establish the conditions necessary for community and for social order itself by limiting the freedom of legal subjects. In other words, public law and public reason are invoked to answer the normative question, how are individuals, whether persons or states, divided over comprehensive conceptions of the good to live together in a just social order. Conversely, the rationale underlying the move to notions of a public-private divide and fundamental rights is to limit the demands of social order itself by protecting the pre-existing liberty of the subjects of that order. In other words, in response to the constraints on pluralism and diversity imposed by public law and public reason, notions of a public-private divide and fundamental rights are invoked in order to answer the normative question, what limits should exist on the demands that a social order may impose on its subjects? This is what Marty Koskinyemi has famously called the double bind, or the controlling paradox of the modern liberal project the dynamic connection between competing conceptions of freedom and order. 
The difficulty, of course, today is that th this Westphalian picture no longer accurately describes, or indeed normatively uh, describes, our modern condition. Descriptively, the forces of globalization and integration between actors in all areas of social, economic, and political life has broken down this uh, separation between spheres. Today, we talk about transnational, supranational, or even global law. As a normative matter, this Westphalian picture has been radically challenged by the rise of cosmopolitan norms of universal justice and human rights. Public, law, public international law no longer regulates relations only between states, but has extended its reach to regulate the rights and duties of individuals within states. This has fundamentally challenged Westphalian accounts of the public-private divide and the sovereignty of states itself. For some liberal internationalists, this is an occasion for dancing in the streets. The, er the erosion of sovereignty is seen to be driving us towards a post-Westphalian convergence. As the walls between states break down, so will the walls between public law and public international law. Central to this argument, I would suggest, is a particular 18th century view of the Enlightenment itself and a pretty direct intellectual assault on the, on the purportedly problematic fact that international law is based, in fact, on an idea of sovereignty arising out of the century that preceded the 18th century Enlightenment, i.e., the events of this, the 17th century and the end of the wars of religion. Well, what I want to do in this lecture is to challenge and problematize this convergence thesis uh, uh, between the two, the two conceptions of public law. I believe it rests on only a partial understanding of the liberal tradition, uh, an understanding which I refer to as liberal anti-pluralism. What's happened, I think, paradoxically, is that human rights have exposed not only injustices carried out in the name of sovereignty, but also the limits of liberal theory itself and its prescription for a universal regime. This is occurring in effect by effectively eliminating the public-private distinction and by redefining fundamental rights to mean only or ultimately the rights of autonomous individuals. Once one takes this uh, normative step, the very idea of sovereignty itself as a mediating device between a wide diversity of private or national political communities and ways of life and a public or international community dissolves to be replaced by a universal or global law. Kant, of course, had this idea a considerable uh, time, uh, prophesized this idea a long time ago. Similarly, the idea of collective subjects as right holders, whether peoples, nations, or minorities, asserting various claims to self-determination, is rejected, or at least premised on the notion that the rights of groups are derivative or contingent on the rights of their members. On this view, sovereignty becomes a human right, the sovereignty of man, as Hirsch Lauterpacht put it, I believe, in 1947, replaces the sovereignty of states, and thereby loses sovereignty in its traditional Westphalian form, loses its tra traditional intersubjective and pluralist function in international law. Well, let me get down to, to some more specific, uh, more specifically to our topic that we're dealing with today. What I want to suggest is that if you agree with what I'm saying, the paradox of international human rights law, and in particular the right to freedom of religion and belief, is that it aims to create space for a non-political normativity in the form of human rights, the right to uh, religious freedom, that is opposable in some sense to the politics of states. But this is in fact undermined by the experience that what rights mean and how they are applied can only be determined by the politics of states themselves. We no longer believe that there is a universal foundation in human nature or autonomous human reason for human rights, and indeed most scholars today reject foundationalist approaches to the question of human rights. However, while we reject the foundations, we still cling to the idea itself. In other words, we reject the conceptual moorings, but cling to the, the, the basic idea of a human right uh, quite strongly. 
If rights cannot, in fact, be outside of politics or ideology, and in fact, if we now see them not as conditions or limits on politics in any kind of objectively ascertainable moral order, but in fact as an effect or outcome of politics, there are, I think, four outcomes that we can point to uh, uh, that I think are, are helpful in thinking about uh, religious freedom in this area. The first is in so-called field constitution, the process by which different areas of social life come to be characterized in terms of rights. The second is in terms of indeterminacy. Rights have no meaning independent of how they are interpreted by a relevant authority in a relevant context. Third, in terms of exceptions to rights. Rights always come with exceptions, as people have talked about today, and the scope of the exceptions are determined by choices which ultimately rely on alternative conceptions of good society. And finally, and this is where most of my work has been in the area of conflict of rights, in any conflict between claims of right, the opposing sides will describe their claims in terms of uh, competing rights. So how does this affect our understanding of religious freedom, uh, and particularly our understanding of religion itself under international human rights law? Well, let's turn to the Danish cartoons controversy to explore this, uh, to explore this idea. Of course, everyone remembers what happened. Uh, the Danish newspaper Jelens Posten in December 2005 published 12 editorial cartoons depicting the Islamic prophet Muhammad, and this led to widespread uh, and violent protests both in, both in Denmark and across the Islamic world. <clears throat> the question I'm interested in is not how this issue may be resolved in any particular domestic system, legal system such as Denmark, but how we might think about this as a matter of international law. Does the communicative act here, the publishing of the cartoons, uh, or perhaps the failure of Denmark uh, to prevent or punish the, the publication of the cartoons, violate human rights norms regarding freedom of religion and belief? Or is it rather an act protected by rights, such as freedom of expression and opinion? And how would we possibly make such a determination? If I could cite Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, how should human beings born free and equal in dignity and rights, endowed with the faculties of reason and conscience, and seeking to act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood, resolve such seemingly intractable uh, and historically situated conflicts? How do we understand, in other words, the relationship in Article 1 between the human as subject and the concepts of reason, conscience, and freedom? Our conscience and and reason, perhaps, the two ascending and descending argumentative positions captured in our singular notion of right, which in a sense straddles between the human and some transcendent or metaphysical sphere of liberty itself. As Saba, uh, Saba Mahmoud has written so elegantly in her recent work, further, what is silenced or perhaps rendered uh, mute by examining these issues through the prism of legal rights uh, in this way? Well, these are the difficult questions uh, that I think we, we need to confront. Part of the reason this has not been very well theorized is the sheer complexity of the rights involved. International and regional rights documents, such as the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights, recognize at least four rights directly related to religion and belief. The individual right to freedom of thought and conscience and religion in Article 18, the right to equal protection of the law and the prohibition on discrimination in Articles 2 and 26, the rights of persons belonging to religious minorities uh, to practice and profess their religion in Article 27, and importantly, the right to protection from incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence in Articles 19 and 20, Paragraph 2. In fact, Article uh, 20 requires states to prohibit by law any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement in this way. The United States has an express reservation to this provision in international law. Uh, and of course, France has an express reservation to Article 27, uh, the clause that protects group or minority rights. And that had, a, I think, a lot 
uh, of impact in the case of the, uh, uh, the headscarves debate in France. Well, what was the reaction following the Danish cartoon, the publication of the Danish cartoons? In the United States, the reaction was, was pretty clear. The weight of legal opinion was in favor of free speech, against any countervailing right to freedom of religion, and in favor of the individual right to freedom of expression, against any countervailing group or minority rights to be free from discrimination, hostility, or violence. In Europe, the position was a bit more complicated. There was some, I think, greater sensitivity shown to these countervailing factors of collective or minority rights, and a genuine, albeit inconclusive, attempt to reconcile the competing claims of right at issue in the very specific context of European intergroup relations uh, and the instruments themselves. By contrast, in the vast majority of Islamic states, the position was as, uh, clear there as well. There was a consensus that the cartoons were part of a wider pattern of discrimination and hostility towards Muslims in Europe, and in particular, they were defamatory of Islam. On the basis that defamation of religions is inconsistent with the right to freedom of expression, the organization of the Islamic Conference has called recently for new legally binding United Nations resolutions to prevent defamation of religion and prophets, and to render all acts defaming Islam as offensive acts subject to punishment. Well, I think the eclectic value pluralist uh, nature of the European position is the one most consistent with the view that I'm advancing today. By considering both the individual and collective interests protected by the right to freedom of religion, we can start to at least glimpse some of the unarticulated premises and particulars masquerading as universals in much of the uh, particularly American writing on this issue. And let me demonstrate this argument uh, uh, by considering Robert Post's recent analysis of the cartoon controversy. Post has identified three possible state interests which could justify legal suppression of the cartoons and he ultimately dismisses all three of them. The first is the suppression of blasphemy. In seeking to resolve the contradiction between keeping public discourse open to all opinions and excluding from public discourse those who would deny what a particular religion regards as sacred, Post concludes that in restricting such speech, the state would lose democratic legitimacy with respect to those who do not believe in the truths protected by a law of blasphemy. Well, the question I have is why, as a normative matter, democratic self-governance as a justification for protecting freedom of expression should necessarily take precedence over the intrinsic value of respect for religions and religious beliefs. Does the state not thereby risk losing its legitimacy with respect to those with sensitive and communal religious convictions? Nothing in international law uh, suggests that Article 19 is necessarily hierarchically or normatively superior to Article 18. And as I mentioned, Article 20, Paragraph 2, expressly requires states to prohibit by law advocacy of religious hatred rising to the level of incitement, discrimination, uh, of inciting discrimination, hostility, or violence. Furthermore, and I think this is most interesting, many European states, such as the United Kingdom, maintain laws prohibiting blasphemy, which have been consistently upheld by the European Court of Human Rights as compatible with Article 10 of the European Convention. Now let me just digress for a moment on this very interesting point. In 2003, after all of this, uh, 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 in, before some of this occurred, a House of Lords Select Committee was appointed to look into the issue of whether existing common law offenses of blasphemy and blasphemous libel should be repealed, and whether there was a need for a new offense of incitement to religious hatred. Now, the reason for this debate was that in English law, uh, blasphemy can only be committed against the Church of England, which is still politically established uh, in England. Interestingly, after months of deliberations, as all good committees do, it was unable to come up with any specific recommendations. It neither, failed to, it neither recommended abolition of blasphemy uh, or creating a new offense of incitement to religious hatred. 
Now, I don't have time to go through the various reasons why the committee was deadlocked on these issues. But what I think is most interesting and obvious when you read the report of the committee uh, is, the, uh, is the apparent incompatibility between the language of the European Convention on Human Rights, which of course is very much in the natural law or natural rights tradition, and the terms in which European political and legal orders have, as a matter of fact, dealt with the problems of religious conflict and religious freedom. The difficulty is that there is no apparent way of reconciling uh, the actual conditions, the actual existing conditions of religious liberty in European nation states with the language of universal human rights in the documents. And let me, let me give you a sense about what I mean. The committee seeds, concedes at some point in the report that the United Kingdom is a democracy but is not a secular state. England is a state whose church is part of its constitution. The committee further concludes that religious belief continues to be a significant component or even determinant of social va values in England. And thirdly, that the state should have a role in embodying the religious identities of its constituent communities. Oscillating then between a view of, of the laws as directed towards maintaining religious peace between the various pluralistic religious traditions in England and a counter view in which the role of the laws is to protect the religious freedom of the cultural identity of the nation, the committee was unable to grasp how to reconcile these two uh, uh, sets of values enshrined in English law. Now this is England we're talking about. Uh, and I think this is a very useful reminder of Alfred Stepan's recent uh, account of what he calls the twin tolerations between religion and the state. In other words, the idea that what really counts for religious free freedom is a system of toleration between different religions and the state itself and not some idealized or a priori notion of the secular or secularism. Indeed, we're aware that many strongly secular states have been deeply hostile to notions of religious freedom. Rather, we need a far more contextual idea of multiple secularisms and the great variations in religion-state relationships that exist in modern democracies uh, in today's world. And a lot of my work has been trying to explore some of those, uh, those different systems or those multiple secularisms. Now, all of this is rather curious. Why, given this enormous uh, uh, and, and very subtle debate that's occurring in the United Kingdom, does Robert Post so easily assume the priority of free speech and its associated justification of democratic legitimation? Well, the answer, I believe, lies in Post's rejection of the second possible state interest in suppression, the protection of religious groups themselves. Post directly attacks the European, Court of, the European Court statement in the Otto Preminger case that persons have a right not to be insulted in their religious beliefs because offenses of this kind inhibits the right to practice a religion. Such a rationale, says Post, excludes from public discourse those whose convictions are offensive to religious groups. The difficulty for Post here is the notion of toleration that lies at the heart of the court's attempt to balance the competing interests at play. In response to the court's assertion of what it calls a spirit of tolerance, um, sorry, in response to the court's assertion that a spirit of tolerance must be a feature of democratic society, Post replies that democracy does not require toleration in the sense that persons abandon their independent evaluation of the beliefs and ideas of others. Otherwise, to the extent that democracy suppresses my expressions of disapproval or condemnation for the actions of groups I dislike, it excludes me from the formation of public opinion. Now, in, in a country like the United States and in a tradition like that of the First Amendment, this is quite an understandable argument. However, it does rest on a series of unexamined, uh, a series of unexamined and underlying assumptions which cannot simply be assumed as a matter of international law. Individual freedom of thought, conscience, and expression, justified on Enlightenment rationalist and secular modernist grounds, 
is clearly the dominant value in Post's normative scheme. Freedom of religion, however, is, combat is compatible with this view primarily to the extent it's understood to encompass an inviolable private or inner realm of belief or conscience, an inner realm understood very much in terms of choice, uh, as we heard in, in one of the earlier panels, the so-called forum internum in European uh, human rights discourse, which is separate from manifestations of that belief. On this view, you may believe in any prophet or religion you wish, provided you don't manifest your beliefs in such a way as to restrict the rights of others to believe or not to believe or to express or not to express themselves as they choose. The difficulty with this argument, and this is really, I think, where the hard work needs to be done, is that it relies, it relies on a prior contingent assumption regarding the equation of religion with belief or conscience. And I think Mayanthi's discussion earlier of the veil in France really captured this idea. There was complete uh, lack of comprehension in France, I think, in, in French law for this a priori understanding of religion in terms of conscience or belief. Now, this may be less obvious in a pluralistic and dominantly Christian or even dominantly Protestant society such as the United States. Although, as we all know, even here, this assumption is inherently problematic and, in fact, is very much part of culture wars in the United States. But in contexts where religion and the state have very different historical configurations and where religious identities uh, define differences between majority and minority national groups and, indeed, between whole different ways of life, this simply is not going to work. Once we understand or once we open our minds to the possibility of religion understood in more communal and public and sensitive uh, uh, aspects, in, in, as I think Islam is understood, at least in some conceptions, Post's argument collapses and the need arises to engage with a genuine conflict of interests internal to the right itself. Why, for example, should Post's assumption not simply be reversed? And in, indeed, I believe many Islamic states have urged this solution to the problem. In other words, the right to peacefully manifest one religion becomes to be regarded as the dominant value as opposed to the right to freedom of expression. On this view, freedom of thought and opinion remains absolutely protected as a matter of thought. But manifestations of that opinion are now open to limitation to the extent that they incite discrimination, hostility, or violence towards religion. The fraught task of calibrating the respective rights and interests now, of course, resumes in earnest. For example, in trying to draw the line between speech that is gratuitously offensive on the one hand and speech that contributes to some form of public debate capable of furthering progress in human affairs on the other. But while these her hermeneutic difficulties obviously remain and keeps lawyers like us in business, the method and mode of reasoning has considerably shifted. It is now respect for the intrinsic value of religious belief and practice or manifestation that provides the unspoken background and tacit starting point for the ensuing rights discourse. In other words, there is a deep entanglement in uh, much thinking on these questions about how we understand historically uh, the concept of religion itself and its relationship to the state. Consider the implications of this argument in the context of Post's rejection of the third possible state interest in suppression, the prevention of discrimination. Here Post suggests that states have an interest in preventing discrimination against Muslims, but that this objective is distinct from the interest in prohibiting and preventing speech that Muslims find offensive. And here he relies on some version of Mill's famous harm principle as articulated in the case of Brandenburg versus Ohio. Content-based restrictions on speech are not permissible unless the speech is directed towards inciting or producing imminent lawless action and likely to incite or produce such action. But what conception of harm is being deployed here? Why should imminent violence be the correct standard as opposed to, say, the Article 20, Paragraph 2 standard of incitement to religious or, re or, uh, or racial discrimination and hostility. Whose harm are we really concerned about in this equation? 
Is it the harm caused by suppressing speech or the harm caused by the speech itself that is our central concern? In the words of Stanley Fish, whose ox is being gored? Different states in different parts of the world, each with their own unique histories and constitutional settlements, have continued to struggle over these questions and reach different forms of accommodation of the rights at issue. And what I want to suggest is, is that there is no clear or clean articulation of the right to freedom of religion in international law. Instead, we need a more strongly pluralist understanding, which opposes Enlightenment, rationalist, or Protestant understandings of religion simply as belief. We need an understanding, in other words, that brings back into play the collective interests that the right to freedom of religion protects. And once these are explicitly brought back into the analysis, as opposed to solely conceptions of individual autonomy, then notions such as discrimination and harm lose the self-assuredness and coolness they assume in Robert Post's hands and become once again essentially contested concepts within divergent religious and cultural nomian spheres. If I'm correct about this, and I of course may not be, uh, then this has profound implications for any mapping of religious toleration in international law. Let me just conclude with one example of this analysis, which I think makes the point rather well, and I think explains why analysis of these sorts of conflicts in terms of Kantian or, or Rawlsian approaches to rights is simply not going to work. <clears throat> if we think about what we might call the liberal algebra, the aim is Kantian in inspiration. Act externally in such a way that the free use of your will is compatible with the freedom of everyone else according to a universal law. Well, how does that actually work in practice? Let me illustrate with an example used by Jeremy Waldron, which I find very hel helpful. Waldron imagines two persons, P and Q. P is an entrepreneurial pornographer who enjoys the public sale and display of his pornographic wares. Q is a devout Muslim who abhors pornography and according to the dictates of her religious beliefs, wishes to live and raise her family in a society free of the public displays of P. This example is really the reverse of uh, Mayanthi's discussion of the veil uh, in one of the earlier panels uh, and the question of how rights impinge on the rights and freedoms of others. Well, how would we resolve this conflict of rights? If we take a kind of Rawlsian approach, we might say that we need some criterion of reasonableness, and that may take the form of the subjection of the, right, of the good to the right. That's the classic Rawlsian approach. But unfortunately, it's not possible on that basis to tell which of P and Q has a, subjection, has a conception of the good that is incompatible with liberal principles. Both P and Q invoke liberal rights, the right to freedom of expression uh, on the one hand and the right to freedom of religion on the other. The second meaning of Rawlsian reasonableness perhaps will help us, the so-called burdens of judgment. But again, this, is un this strategy is unable to tell us which of P and Q's conceptions is unreasonable. Well, what about th this is the real problem. Perhaps the real problem here is that Q is unable to assert her claims uh, in publicly accessible terms, right? In other words, her conception of a certain public moral environment free of pornography and blasphemy, the problem with that conception is that it depends on premises that are internal to her religious faith and that might seem arbitrary from an external point of view. But again, for Waldron, this approach simply will not work. I don't think, he says, that there is any way of saying that a set of permissions is adequate for the practice of a religion except by paying attention to how that set of restrictions seems from the internal point of view of the religion itself. To abandon any interest in this would in effect be to abandon any real concern for adequacy. In other words, the, the fact that liberal rights protect the right to, to freely practice uh, one's religion. An externally stated adequacy condition, which was quite at odds with internal conceptions, would be arbitrary and unmotivated. Well, lastly, and, and I'll conclude with this, 
Perhaps the classic Rawlsian original position can tell us which of P and Q uh, uh, is in the wrong, as it were. But again, here we face a predicament. By viewing religion a priori in Protestant Enlightenment terms as private conscience, and thus restricting the field of aims among which compossibility is to be sought, the real dilemmas involving religion in terms of its public role in shaping a communal set of practices and a collective way of life are not resolved, they're simply elided or avoided. The great genius of the original position is that it takes the real question off the table. In, it's a strategy of avoidance rather than resolution. In relation to P and Q then, Waldron, the great liberal philosopher, concludes that there is no determinate solution to the problem of compatibility of rights, with the result that we can no longer confront cases like that of Salman Rushdie with the conviction that there is a perfectly good solution of live and let live if only people would restrain themselves sufficiently to adopt it. There is simply no such accommodating solution. It means that we can no longer organize, this is Waldron, liberal aspirations around the Kantian kingdom of ends. The algebra intimated in Rawls's principle of an adequate liberty for each, compatible with a similar liberty for all, is simply insoluble. Now, in conclusion, what I want to suggest is that Waldron's analysis, which I find extraordinarily illuminating, brings to the surface problems of incommensurability and incompatibility between different, uh, between different claims of this kind, and they therefore raise a critical challenge to any account of rights based on uh, what, what Waldron calls the liberal algebra of a fixed structure of rights. We are left to ask then whether the liberal premise rests on a misunderstanding, because it fails to take seriously the incommensurability of values, or perhaps on an impossibility because not everyone's individual freedom can be respected and ensured consistently with the freedom of everyone else, unless, of course, everyone adopts Rawls and Kant's pre-existing notion of religion as private conscience. Liberal theory can resolve such conflicts only by tacitly positing a hierarchy of values. This is what Robert Post does. Perhaps a, a trumping or covering value uh, of, of individual autonomy, or by, drawing, or by drawing domain restrictions between public and private spheres, between, that is, spheres of incommensurable values. And having drawn the, the lines between spheres, then developing theories of toleration based on open, open textured principles, such as reasonableness in the Rawlsian sense, or the margin of appreciation, as it's been developed in European uh, Court of Human Rights jurisprudence. And I think I'll end with that. Thank you. So let me put in a, a pitch for uh, the Kantian uh, numinal uh, sort of agenda. Uh, and it, goes, it goes something like this. I may, I may be misrepresenting your position. There was a lot in there, and you know, without the text in front of us, there's, there's some detail that I probably glossed over. But if I'm, if I'm a member of a, of a religious minority, or any kind of minority, a minority of, of uh, lifestyle, a sexual uh, orientation minority, the, the Kantian story has something that going for it. I mean, part of part of what you said towards the beginning of your talk about rights, there's this liberal story which is based on a metaphysical, in your view, kind of illusion, which is that we have these sort of uh, rights that are deliverances of pure reason, uh, whereas in fact they're they're political instruments, sort of politics all the way all the way down. Now, if I'm um, a member of the majority, I listen to you and I say, well, that that's great. You know, uh, rights have in fact been used. If I look at a country like Canada, um, you know, where we have a variety of instruments for, for promoting a sort of multiculturalist agenda, we have Section 27 of our Constitution. I think it's 27. I'm always bad at this sort of thing. Which says that Canada is a multicultural society and that its laws must be interpreted in a manner that's compatible with that. And then we have the standard charter, uh, the standard sort of uh, uh, regime of individual rights. Now, in the last 25 years, if you look at all the cases that have had to do with uh, 
religious members of religious minorities suing for some kind of an accommodation, but they have used uh, quite, quite strategic in a quite strategically sort of rational way mm -hmm. individual rights to a much greater degree than they have Section 27. Um, so, you know, so I worry about um, taking the implications of your. Uh, sort of metaphysical critique of rights too far because they would end up playing into the hands of majorities that would want to say it's politics all the way down, great. If it's politics all the way down, we win every time, right? Uh, and taking a tool away from minorities who have actually um, employed individual rights uh, strategies in quite a, uh, a, 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 quite, you know, quite an intelligent way, and in so doing, have also um, sort of taken the wool, taken the, the rug out from an argument which is often made by uh, opponents of religious minorities, oh, they don't want to play along according to our rules. Well, what are you talking about? You don't, we don't want to talk according to your rules. We are using your rule book in order to um, sort of make our, our case uh, for accommodation. So, you know, it's sort of coming, uh, redefending the sort of Kantian uh, there's something special about rights agenda on prudential grounds rather than sort of nominal ones. But I worry about, uh, you know, baby in bathwater sort of uh, mm -hmm. concerns. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think anything you've said uh, would, would bother me, except that I see politics all the way down occurring in, say, the Canadian Supreme Court. Right? And so to the extent that the Canadian Supreme Court recognizes minority rights claims, it's because for very strong political reasons, say a theory of toleration which Canadians have developed over time in their communities, the court is willing to recognize those claims. The court could just as easily not recognize them. Uh, and you know, we see numerous examples of courts around the world limiting the claims of minorities in different ways. And of course, the, uh, the veil controversy in France is perhaps the most obvious uh, 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 example of that. Um, so I'm certainly not rejecting the idea of rights, um, and I'm certainly not rejecting the idea that there needs to be toleration between conflicting claims in a, in a society. What I am rejecting is the idea that there is some uh, a priori rational solution to these problems that the judges somehow have access to in, in uh, a rationalist metaphys metaphysical philosophy that can somehow resolve these problems. And it may be that courts are an effective way of patrolling the claims of different groups in society. Um, you know, so for example, if you think of the famous case in, in this country of Wisconsin versus Yoda, the claims of an Amish community to, to, to not send their children to school, uh, the court really had to struggle to explain why one section of the community could be exempted from an otherwise uh, general law which required children to go to school. Uh, and ultimately, the decision of the court uh, was a political, I, I use political not in the sort of pejorative sense, but in, a, in the sense that the court was willing to concede a sphere of autonomy to the Amish community to run its life according to its own beliefs. Um, and that required the court, in a sense, to do mental gymnastics to contradict the Kantian uh, notion of rights. In other words, uh, if you look at a case like that, all the cases of exemptions from, from general laws, what courts have to explain is why certain citizens are to be treated differently from others. And so we develop these very fancy ideas of substantive neutrality and uh, substantive equality, uh, which you know, is, is an impressive way of handling these competing claims. But the court could just as easily do what it did in the Smith case, the, pay, the famous peyote case, and say, tough. Klamath Indians don't get any exemption. Amish do. Somebody explain to me why. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, uh, really, really clear and really uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, talk, and I'm sure we could continue for quite some time. Um, just, uh, you mentioned the headscarf case. Of course, the court, the, the Conseil d'Etat, that's what you meant by court in this case, I believe, was the one that was actually continuing to, at least in principle, uphold the rights of girls in public schools to wear headscarves. It took a, it took a statute, in fact, to, uh, to change the situation, and, it, and um, in, in, indeed it was the, um, 
uh, the, the person, uh, Jean-Paul Costa, who was on both the, 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 the State Council and the European Court of Human Rights, who said that a statute would actually probably pass muster better at the European level than would the current uh, practice of the court. So in this case, it really was um, highly manipulated popular will uh, uh, that led to the, that led to the, uh, the change. But I wanted to right. ask if, it, if things look different. For, I mean, I, I'm thinking about your P and Q example, the Waldron yeah. example. And actually, um, your, uh, your example of the, uh, the poor committee that deliberated for a long time and couldn't, you know, struck <laughs> me that that's probably a good example of this, right? And uh, playing an important role there, because that sets it into a national tradition here, the tradition of establishment, right, as you, as you very clearly did. But think about another instance where something like that P and Q uh, actually is a real world example, which is the Netherlands. Yeah. Where, in fact, uh, it's in, in a sense the key issue, the key f flashpoint uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know the, the, the problem posed by Islam has to do with tolerance of gay men in public displays. That's that's the sort of major attack launched against Muslims. And so the P and Q would be uh, Q is the uh, P R R uh, the gay biker parades in Amsterdam. You know we want the right to do that to have the. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but there yeah. are fairly often these you know, uh, uh, parades of, of, of gay guys, uh, which is pl applauded as an example of the famous Dutch toleration, you know, the sort of, the weak form of the resouling of the pillarization. At least that's how my friends in the Netherlands explain why that's so important, right? Yeah. And so the Q is the, is the woman who now um, wants to bring up her children free of having to look at gay men in public and yeah. having to live in a society where gay men are considered to be tolerable. Does this change the way you think about it? Because now you have the you have, you have toleration of a minority, a public display of a of a difference, being uh, being being the issue, and not not freedom to distribute pornography, which was the Waldron case. Does it change at all? Perhaps not, because as you said in your response to Daniel's question, you're, you're simply saying there's no magic solution. Well, yeah. if if that's what you continue to go with your answer, will surely be no. This doesn't change it at all. But I'm wondering if that were the the case, and this is a real world case, yeah. more like Waldron's example. If, if you add anything, if it would modify your conclusions. No, thank you. That, I mean, that's, it certainly challenges the, the, the fact, the, the, the P and Q fact scenario, uh, and changes the, our, our perceptions, I guess, of the, uh, of the goods at issue. Um, although, um, you know, you see this debate actually playing out in the United States at the moment over gay marriage itself, I think, in, in, a, in a similar way. The, the claim that by allowing marriage to include uh, same-sex uh, partners, that in some sense would challenge and be an affront to more traditional conceptions um, of marriage. Um, and of course, with my students, I, I play that out in, in similar ways. You know, why not polygamous marriage? Why not gay uh, incestuous marriage, where uh, reproduction is not possible? You know, gets over the taboo of incest and so on. You can, you can go through all these uh, configurations. And I, I guess my, my point is that um, ultimately these require theories of toleration and uh, conceptions of uh, relations between different groups in society. Uh, and that rights, the, the, the language of rights provides a framework by which to analyze those claims, but it provides no way to resolve them. Uh, and whether that can be resolved in a, should be resolved in a court uh, or whether it should be resolved through some kind of dialogic process between the groups themselves, I think is what I'm most interested in. Uh, I'm not sure at all why five judges in Washington are uniquely qualified to resolve that problem. But with the book in the Dutch case, it's not Dutch tradition. Right. It's not just two conceptions of rights. It's here's our society. I'm not, I'm not pro-Dutch in this argument particularly at all. I'm just, you know, the argument is, and of course it plays into the immigration issues and trying to keep let people stay where they are if they don't like our way of life. You know, here's our tradition, you came in. Does, does that, uh, so it's a, different, it's a different sort of debate than between two conceptions of rights in the end. Right, and, and it gets to the question, what is Dutch national life? Right. Sure. And it, it, you know, it requires a discussion and a dialogue over whether that includes uh, different conceptions of these competing goods. Tolerating and tolerating. That's right. And you know, presumably the state at some point may step in and draw that line. Um, and I, you know, what I'm suggesting is the state should be very careful about that because in order, to, in order to undertake the line drawing exercise, it has to recognize that it's doing so uh, 
um, uh, in a way that is going to be highly controversial as between the competing the claims. Well. Yeah. And it may get. I, j I just wanted to pick first. Oh, sorry, I wanted to thank you for your presentation and just pick up on the language of, um, you know, the limits of, uh, of the language, le uh, 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 sort of legal kind of frameworks within which uh, we view things. And I wanted to pick up on Saba's work, but, um, you know, drawing on your example of the Danish cartoons, I wonder if you could offer some insights as to how we would, how we could frame this if this was not about, you know, religion or blast, you know, uh, versus uh, freedom of expression, but rather just something very otherwise, I hate to use these terms, but secular as a p personal injury, right? So that, in fact, the offense taken by Muslims uh, to um, the uh, depictions of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not really around the fact that the Prophet is sacred and to be upheld in, uh, you know, it, it's not blasphemy in that sense. It's actually uh, something that's, it's a misrecognition of something which is just a very, per, is a personal injury. And what I mean by this is that, in fact, the prophet is not, um, uh, uh, ex he's extraordinary, but not extraordinary as sacred. He's in fact part of Muslim everyday life. And so when people uh, felt betrayed by these cartoons, it was not because of blasphemy. It's, it's actually because of personal injury felt, as if they would have felt uh, if it were a family member being made fun of or mocked. Right. So in fact, in some ways, it's a different framework within which to think about it, that it's not religion versus a certain kind of uh, freedom of expression, but just personal injury that was felt. It happened to be a lot of people who felt this personal injury, but it's in fact because of the everydayness that Muslims embody in yeah. terms of prophetic, the prophetic practice, yes. right? So it could be been your mother being made fun of, your father, your cousin, and, yes. and that that sort of thing. Yes. Uh, well, that yeah, thank you. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, there are just two things I would say in response to it. The first is that, in, at least in my following of the debate in Denmark, uh, you almost got a sense by those who supported the publication of the cartoons that it was the causing of injury and offense itself that was actually most important. Right? The idea was that by, by causing offense, you could disrupt and, and, and break that relationship that you were just describing, uh, and which Saba, I think, has described in her work. The idea that one can be seriously committed to the prophet in some personal sense was itself something that actually should be attacked. Uh, and maybe I'm overstating the case, but I think that was very interesting because uh, the, you know, there was a sense that that, that was um, that was a challenge to secular, uh, secular understandings of, of reason and rationality and so on. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, someone, uh, for example, made a comment about how inappropriately dressed she was at a New York party, and he threatened the journalist to, to threaten to kill the journalist with a baseball bat because a personal injury offense was taken that his wife was made fun of. And I would put the example in the same way uh, of the ways in which Muslims can uh, embody the prophet as, as every day in their lives. It's the same kind of injury felt but we assign different meaning to it and we say one is religious hurt and one is secular hurt. Right. Somehow religious hurt is irrational, secular hurt is somehow tolerable. So that's, that's the kind of distinction I was trying to make. That, absolutely right. And, and you know, uh, there's no real harm because religion is only an internal matter of, of belief. Uh, uh, and the, the, the second point was that, of course, in law, we have all sorts of categories for different types of hurt. You know, we have defamation laws, we have the category of fighting words, we have obscenity laws uh, that get deployed in all sorts of ways to restrict speech. So the question is why we have such a difficulty uh, having a category for, for the, the cartoons. Uh, and I think you've put your finger on it. Yeah. Uh, Peter, I need to thank you, but also to curse you. You've both emboldened me, but also confounded me.
and here's what's going on. As an atheist, I feel that it's very hard to raise a child in America. I feel that uh, atheists are often regarded as immoral, that they are going to hell. There is constant badgering all around everywhere you look of uh, being saved, being called to Jesus. Uh, it's extremely difficult to uh, raise a proud atheist child in America. Uh, you are being threatened with constant e eternal damnation. As a, I've read my fish, I like, I like fish as much as the next guy. You can't tell me that atheism is not a religion. Furthermore, I have no way whatsoever to adjudicate the difference between the harm of being threatened with eternal damnation and the harm of being threatened with some kind of secular injury. So that's why I'm emboldened, because now I feel, wait a second, all this time I was thinking, bite your tongue, they're not harming you, besides what harm principle are you gonna use? It's not like physical harm is really the only kind of harm. I think my rights are being violated, and because I've read Fish like you, it's actually my religious rights, my religious freedom, and I'm emboldened now to act on this. On the other hand, I have this problem. All this time, having read Kant, having read Rawls, having read Voltaire, I know that rights are not uh, universal, rights are not inviolable, rights are not absolute, that every right automatically comes with it a certain kind of ba balancing. And I've never met any liberal theorist or any other kind of legal theorist who said that religious rights are uh, are to be self-described and are to be self-ascribed and are, and, are, uh, and are endlessly sort of wide. So now I have this problem that there's an outstanding Islamic jurisprudence, impeccable Islamic jurisprudence of why it is Islamically legal to kill apostates and non-Muslim people who commit sebenebi or the blasphemy or the, or the, uh, the slander of the prophet. I have no way of adjudicating the rights of a fellow citizen to be able to express against the rights of my fellow religious citizen who says in order to manifest Islam, in order to act according to Islamic law, I cannot submit Islamic law to any kind of secular uh, 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 boundary making. So those are my two dilemmas. I hope you could talk me out of it. <laughs> I think I may need two bottles of wine. Uh, uh, to deal with that, but lucky we're in Berkeley. Um, I mean, I, I think what you're describing is 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 something that that um, uh, Charles Taylor has talked about, which is the the fact that in these types of discussions, the disagreement between believers of different stripes, on the one hand, for all their other differences, uh, and atheists or non-believers on the other, is actually the the, the strongest line at the moment in some of these debates. I mean, the most acrimonious debate between what the, what the nature of the secular actually is. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking of the sort of Richard Dawkins uh, type polemics against uh, religion as a kind of immature and in, in, in sort of infantile uh, normative system, which, you know, we'd be better off rid of. And I assume that's not what you're saying. No, I'm saying as an atheist now, uh -huh. I have a good jurisprudence to say that these texts which are saying I'm damned to hell and I'm a bad citizen are a violation of my liberty, my violation of my rights. And I have a certain rationale now for thinking that I have reasons for opening up the possibility of constraining religious discourse because it's an offense against my stature as a citizen. It incites hatred of atheists. It incites all kinds of uh, difficulties and mingling in, in, in certain kinds of societies. Mm -hmm. Well, it's in. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, that, that's why I'm emboldened because now I feel, you know, I can take Hitchens and I can take Dawkins and I can take Danchin and I can say, bring it on. Let's, let's legalize this way. <laughs> you don't seem too injured. <laughs> Thanks to you, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, uh, you know, I'm happy. I think, I think what I'm trying to say yeah. is that there's an absurdity in this treatment of these rights as if they are purely a third person matter. What I think Daniel was trying to say is that what you, I think what you entirely missed was the second person element of democratic citizenship, Kantian and Rawlsian ethics in right. It's a matter of not P and Q having this dilemma and us sitting up here and adjudicating it. It's about citizens giving reasons to one another 
as to why freedom should be limited, understanding that those reasons have to be some kind of reasons for the other, and knowing that the final thing has to be somehow generalizable. So if my offending Q is, is relevant, then so Q is offending me. And this is, I think, also the point about the gay case, right? And that's one thing, you know, we don't want to offend pornographers, we don't want to offend people that offend Muslims. But when it comes to other oppressed minorities, then we're going to say, you can keep on going around forever and ever and ever in this matrix. And the only way of getting out of it is by elaborating some kind of, you know, judicial conception of harm that allows us to say, you do not have a right to be free from any kind of offense to your opinions or your feelings or the things that you hold valuable, because not doing that gives every single person a, you know, the capacity to write the law themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and, and but what's missing with this attack on liberalism is not that liberalism is perfect or that it doesn't get all these things wrong, but it misses the second person element. It, 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 it misses the fact that it's a matter of face-to-face -face justification between free and equal citizens. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are allowed to bring in religion, but that's also why religion is not given a veto. And that's, I think that, that's why I think this kind of, you know, cutesy, you know, critiquing of, of law as as arbitrary and as not giving these, these uh, lockdown answers doesn't really get at the heart of that. Mm -hmm. I think I think the I think the uh, what what I would say in response to that is is that there has to be some there has to be some theory of toleration that would apply in the scenario that you're describing, mm -hmm. and what I'm suggesting is that there's no a priori way of resolving that conflict of of, of rights. Um, in other words, atheists and and devout believers would need to come to some kind of accommodation of each other's positions from a second person perspective. What I'm opposing is some answer to that problem uh, which, is, which is resting on a priori premises that aren't necessarily universalizable. Um, and uh, I think, I, I don't think that that analysis misses the second person viewpoint, it simply challenges the way the second person viewpoint has actually been institutionalized into rights discourse. So, if I could throw it back to you, how do you resolve the conflict between P and Q as an atheist? Uh, well, I'm not going to enter into it as an atheist because I have no dog in that fight. But I mean, I'm saying, <laughs> you know, it's, it's perfectly clear to say, you know, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to say that there are legitimate grounds for restricting the spread of pornography. You can take a reasonable, you know, you can respect the person's desire to have certain spaces where they can raise their children according to a conception of the good, but that doesn't. You know, you can have even Dworkin just talk about zoning and all these kinds of things. But what you were trying to suggest, as I understand it, is that the leap to then saying, you know, my religious freedom rests on the fact that nowhere in this society is the, 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 does the specter haunt me that I might be confronted with things that are from outside of my religious conception of the good, that I have this, that, that, that the freedom not only to isolate my child, but even when the child goes out into the world, that she is not going to be confronted with things that aren't what I, the environment that I would create. Mm -hmm. That is what the absurdity is. And, and, and I think what was going on is you were trying to say, aha, but you believe in religious freedom. And if you believe in religious freedom, then you're committed to saying, you know, you have to enter into this person's conception of religious freedom and that these are co-equal rights. But you made no argument whatsoever that, by, that, that, the, that the Danish cartoons or pornography does in fact violate religious freedom. All we know is that some people don't like it. But there's lots of things that people don't like. So, you, so there's a huge, there's like three steps missing in your argument. You need to show not only that some people don't like it and they call it a matter of religious freedom, but that those of us who meet one another in a complex society that don't all share the same kind of perspective might have some kind of reasons for consistently saying, yes, this is a stable conception of what freedoms people need in order to practice their religion that isn't just a matter of uh, uh, an absolute subjective <coughs> sense of, of what people want and what people don't like. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. You have to ask well. If you well, I think there's some more questions, but I'm not sure if you want no, to take them off. We meet tomorrow at 9.30 here and we can ask all the questions, so thank you very much. <laughs>